Tonight, he's in. President Biden running for re-election. So what's he up against this time around? The president formally announcing his bid for 2024 with this video, vowing to protect Americans' personal freedoms and attacking MAGA extremists. The president then giving a speech to union workers in D.C., vowing to, quote, finish the job. But the announcement comes as Biden, who is currently 80 years old, faces very low approval ratings, with the majority of Americans surveyed in an NBC News poll saying they do not want him to run. He could also take on former President Trump again, who is currently leading the polls for the GOP nomination. But is Trump about to skip out on the Republican debates? We'll explain. Also tonight, Florida Senator Marco Rubio live on Top Story. What he thinks about the 2024 election, Biden, Trump, and a potential run for president from his state's governor, Ron DeSantis. The Republican senator, also the vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee. The concerns from Capitol Hill about China's military capabilities and their budding relationships with Latin American countries, including U.S. adversary Nic Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega. Crossing the line, Fox's primetime lineup now without Tucker Carlson, as a former producer continues to lobby serious allegations against him and his staff. So what may have led to his sudden departure? Plus, the surviving roommate in the University of Idaho murders fighting a subpoena that would force her to face alleged killer Brian Koberger in court Why the defense is calling her to testify. Bud Light shakeup, controversy still brewing for the beer giant, more than a month after it sent a transgender influencer a beer can with her face on it. Two top executives now reportedly placed on leave. And ticket for one, the wild video showing a moose walking into a movie theater in Alaska and going straight for the popcorn. How the theater eventually got this non-paying customer out. Top story starts right now. And good evening. The race for 2024 shaping up after months of speculation. President Biden officially launching his re-election bid. The president releasing this campaign video today, starting with a montage of January 6 clips and scenes from the Supreme Court during the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The president promising to protect Americans' freedoms, calling for unity and saying it's time to, quote, finish the job. The president also sharing that message in person, holding a rally for union workers in D.C. just hours after releasing that video. Today's campaign announcement coming on the same day he announced his 2020 bid for president. But here's what he's up against now. The president is currently 80 years old, right? He would turn 82 in the weeks following the 2024 election and would be about 86 when that term was over. And in a new NBC News poll released just over the weekend, 70 percent of Americans said they did not want him to run again. A majority of them Democrats and nearly half citing his age as the reason. Where the race stands right now, it looks like it could be a rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. You may remember these debates and what that was like. President Trump, currently 76 years old, and the former president, the current frontrunner right now for the GOP nomination. Tonight, Senator Marco Rubio will join Top Story Live in just a few moments. We'll ask him about the election, what the country needs right now, the growing threat from China, and the dangerous deals so many Latin American countries are ready to make with the communist superpower right in our backyard. But we begin with Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander and that announcement from President Biden. Tonight, President Biden asking Americans for another four years, making a pitch to union members in Washington. On my watch, infrastructure has become a decade headline. A decade. Earlier, announcing another campaign Personal in this video. Fears. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. Highlighting his views on abortion, voting, and LGBTQ rights, while zeroing in on Republican opponents who he never mentions by name. Personal freedom is fundamental to who we are as Americans. The MAGA extremists are lining up to take on those bedrock freedoms. And touting this theme. Let's finish this job. I know we can. Still, our NBC News poll shows only 41% of Americans approve of the job President Biden is doing. 54% disapprove. The president's move setting up a possible rematch with former President Trump posting this response. With such a calamitous and failed presidency, it is almost inconceivable that Biden would even think of running for re-election. 70% of Americans say they don't want President Biden to run for re-election, including most Democrats. But 60% of Americans say they don't want Mr. Trump to run again either. 
Today in Battleground, Pennsylvania, the critical Philly suburbs, we found voters like small business owner Dora Rietta exasperated by the possibility of another Biden-Trump showdown. What do you make of that rematch? A mess. A mess. Why? I think they both are very extreme, and I think we need someone that's kind of in the middle. Cafe owner Christine Hicks strongly supports President Biden because she says he'll protect abortion rights. For my granddaughter, I want her to have choice, and it is upsetting to know that she has less choices now than we did. But she's less supportive of Vice President Kamala Harris, who's featured prominently in today's video. I don't think I would vote for Kamala if she was running for president, but she's, you know... She supports him, and I think it's a good thing. Independent Larry Largest, a painter, is frustrated by high inflation. Are you sure. satisfied with the economy these days? No, I'm really not. Prices are going up, rent's going up, food's going up, my wages aren't going up. And echoing what polls say many are concerned about, President Biden's age. He'd be 86 at the end of a second term. I think he's getting a little long in the tooth. He's getting a little bit old, you know, and I have some concerns on his mental faculties. But retired truck driver Mike Lowry tells us he's not worried. I'm 72 years old. You look good. There you go. <laughs> Every, I rest my case. So it looks good. It looks good for an 80-year-old man. Peter Alexander joins us tonight live here. Peter, White House press secretary today. She caused a stir when asked if President Biden would serve out the full term if reelected. Yeah, Tom, that's right. That happened in today's White House press briefing where she was asked that very question. She said that was something for the president to decide that she didn't want to get ahead of it, which left in the eyes of a lot of people watching the sense that President Biden may not be committed to running all eight years. She later posted, or to serving all eight years, she later posted a statement, in fact, saying that he would serve all eight years if reelected. This is really one of the first moments where we're seeing the White House officials trying to navigate that line between speaking on behalf of a president and an incumbent presidential candidate. There is a 1939 law, the Hatch Act, that prohibits an executive branch employee from getting involved in political activities while on the job, Tom. Yeah, a bit of a mixed message there, but also some, some laws they have to follow. Switching to the Republican side now, former President Trump suggesting he may not take part in the Republican debates in the primary? Yeah, you're right. The former president making that suggestion on Truth Social, his social media platform, suggesting he may not show up for the first and second Republican debates. The first one scheduled to take place about four months from now in August, former President Trump saying that no one reached out to his campaign to confirm those dates and basically saying that he shouldn't have to subject himself to sharing a debate stage with his rivals, given the huge lead he has in early polls. You'll remember the president skipped out on a couple debates back in 2016, the former president, we should say, and showed up to all of them despite suggesting otherwise back in 2019 and 2020. All right, good um, points there, Peter. It would be major, a major event if he didn't show up for those debates. Peter, we appreciate you leading us off tonight here on Top Story. We just heard President Biden setting up his campaign, but with GOP hopefuls already lining up in opposition, how will the candidates make their pitch to voters? I'm grateful tonight to be joined by Florida Senior Senator Marco Rubio on Top Story. Senator, you posted a response video to the president's announcement today and said the country, quote, can't afford another four years of President Biden. What's your argument so Americans vote for the Republican Party rather than just against President Biden? Well, I think that's pretty clear that in the two years he's been president, two and a half years, our country is weaker in comparison to our adversaries who have grown stronger. Our former allies are hedging their bets around the world. And here at home, we've become heavily dependent on foreign sources of energy, whether it's oil from the Middle East and Venezuela, which they're begging for, or solar panels and batteries that are dominated by China. And on top of everything else, I think we're more bitterly divided. At the end of the day, Joe Biden ran on the promise that we're going to go back to something more conventional. Uh, something that may unite us, maybe calm the waters in politics. That's not what he's done. He's bitterly divided us. He went to Georgia and said if you, weren't in, if you were in favor of some voting law that they passed there, that you were a segregationist and a supporter of Jim Crow um, on, on a consistent basis. Even today in his announcement video, he's basically telling people that 35, 40, 45 percent of the country are a bunch of extremists that are dangerous to the country. So he's bitter, further bitterly divided us, didn't keep his word on that. So we're more divided, they're weaker, our adversaries are stronger. I don't know if we can afford another four or five years of that. Do you think they're not being upfront with the American people? We saw that Peter was reporting about that exchange with the press secretary earlier today, that, that possibly President Biden will run for re-election, but not have a plan to serve out his full second term? 
Well, I think the reality of it is this. Look, when I ran for president, a lot of people thought I was too young. And I do think that there's going to come time where common sense will tell you you have to start questioning whether someone in their mid to late 80s is going to be there to serve out a term. And, and that's why I think when Americans go vote, they're going to have to keep in mind you're voting for Joe Biden or against him, but you're also potentially voting for Kamala Harris to be president at some point. I think that's going to be a factor. Polls show former President Trump to be the front runner. What's your take on his suggestion today that he not participate in the Republican debates, the first of which is coming up right around the corner in August? My take is that one of the talents that uh, President Trump has is his ability to garner attention. And so on a, I've lived it when I was a candidate. I've seen it when he was president. I think on a pretty regular basis now, he will say or do something that will ensure that he dominates the news cycle that day or is in the news cycle that day. He may not show up. He didn't show up to Iowa the last time he ran. But, uh, but these things are, are part of his ability to sort of garner a lot of attention and, and get, you know, people like you and others to ask me. I know you have to. I'm just saying, you know, that's, uh, I think that's part of it. So we'll, Senator, we'll see how that plays out. You, you actually set up my next question, then. The closest contender to former President Trump right now, according to the polls, is the governor of your state, Ron DeSantis. Yeah. I know he's someone you know pretty well. What advice would you give the governor if he decides to run? And, and, and what kind of advice would you give his campaign in, in a race where he will be up against Donald Trump? And as you mentioned, the media attention that comes with that. Yeah, look, I think President Trump benefits from being a de facto, in essence, uh, incumbent Republican president. He's not in office, but he benefits from a lot of the same things that would come from a de facto uh, incumbent Republican president. And so, um, and so that, that's obviously a hill to climb that he has and all the other candidates that are in the race or, or could potentially get in the race will have to face. You know, my advice is the same that I use for everybody. It's, I think being genuine is the most important thing in politics today. If you try to be someone you're not or do things that you don't believe in, it's going to come across, especially in a presidential race. And, um, and so I just think that everyone, you know, sometimes being genuine, standing for what you believe in or actually being who you are, sometimes it works out. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't. But I do think it gives you the best chance of success. And I know that sounds like a generic or a pretty broad piece of advice, but it's a tough one because oftentimes people are telling you this is what you have to say or this is what you have to become in order to win. It really doesn't work. I think it's one of the things that's helped President Trump, like him or hate him. I don't think anyone thinks it's an act. Any advice on personal attacks? It's already gone to that. Uh, and it's gotten pretty serious with Governor DeSantis already, and Governor DeSantis hasn't even announced. Well, you know, everyone says they don't like those things, and but at the same, same time, it's part of, part of politics in some ways is nonviolent combat. It's a competition, right? And, and so you're trying to argue not just why you should be the person, but you're trying to instill doubts about whether you should vote for somebody else. So there are going to be attacks in this campaign, both on the Republican side and if there were, like there was on the Democrat side when they had a primary a few years ago. Um, it's just a fact, and, and I think obviously you have to be careful about it. And again, it has to be genuine. If, it, if it's outside of character, I think people will see it as something else. And so, look, it's it's just part of the the the, the attributes of these races. What, are the, what are the issues? What are the issues you hope Republicans focus on in 2024? People like possibly Senator Tim Scott, who I also know you have a relationship with. What do you want to hear from people like that? Well, I, I, I honestly believe we live in a historic moment. People have said that, but this is a geopolitical moment unlike anything we have faced in 30, 40 years. The world is literally changing right underneath us, both economically and geopolitically in the countries. And where there, We have a near-peer adversary in China. We haven't had one since the end of the Cold War, and China already is more powerful than the Soviet Union ever was. And so we need to start talking about that, even as we are always constantly focused on the daily trees of American politics, we're missing the forest. I think it's important that the next president, and I hope it'll be a Republican president, is someone who has a broad vision for what's happening in the world and an answer for it, because it's changing so fast, it's left a lot of people behind, globalization left a lot of Americans behind, and we need to have answers for those people, or we're going to continue to be divided in this country. Before we turn to China and Latin America, we're going to have a few questions on that. I do want to ask you, though, do you think former President Trump is beatable in a GOP primary? I think he's a tough candidate. Look, I ran against the guy. The guy is, is, is talented. He has the ability. He understands media cycles and attention as much as anything else. I think he also has an argument to make, which is when I was president, whether you like my daily tweets or not, you know, most of Latin America and the Western Hemisphere was aligned with us. We did the Abraham Accords in the Middle East. North Korea wasn't launching weapons and, and Putin wasn't invading Ukraine. And, and, and our economy was doing better up until COVID hit. So I, I do think he will have a record to run on, which he didn't have the last time. And I think his campaign appears to be more professionalized and operating more conventionally than, than his previous races. But I have seen so many things I never would have thought over the last six or seven years, the most unpredictable six or seven years in modern history. I, I think uh, it would be foolish to make any predictions right now. But I do think he's the front runner and the favorite. Also two impeachments and, of course, January 6th, all of which he's going to have to to run against. Um, you're, you're, you're the vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee. 
We've learned a lot about China's military capabilities with the recent leaks of classified documents, coupled with the news of the spy balloon we've been following. Tell our viewers what concerns you most right now about China. I think China is positioning itself militarily to be not just to be the most powerful nation in the in the Indo-Pacific, but to dominate it and to force us out of it. And people have to understand if that were to happen, you're talking about 60 or 70 percent of the global economy, you know, over half the world's population lives in two countries in that region. When you add the other ones in, it gets closer to 70 percent. So you're talking about a big deal. It would turn America into a continental power. We would not be a Pacific power for the first time since the end, since before the Second World War. And they're building a military. They're not going to invade the coast of California. But if they can hold that risk, our aircraft carriers, our ability to project power in that region, the other countries are going to become vassal states. They're going to have to surrender to Chinese power. And we're going to have to pay a toll for any products that we try to ship to Asia or get from Asia here. It concerns me deeply because that military capability, they're focused on it like a laser. There's a lot of inefficiency in dictatorships, but the one thing they can do is they can make decisions without having town hall meetings, and they're moving very quickly, much faster than we are, in, in building up those capabilities and in our ability to respond. We've committed to covering Latin America here on Top Story every night, and we've done a few investigations into the cozy relationship the Chinese are building with countries in our own backyard, from Caribbean nations to countries like El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. What, what concerns you the most, and have, have you brought this up to, to, to your colleagues and even to the White House? No, I think there's a growing awareness of it, obviously. Unfortunately, the Western Hemisphere doesn't receive a lot of attention here or in other places unless there's a migratory crisis or something like that happening. But the Chinese are there for two reasons. The first is that they want uh, access to mineral rights. They want access to rare earth minerals. They want access to those kinds of things. And the second is uh, they want to have a geopolitical presence as a global power. And I think they view, they want to turn the Western Hemisphere into what they believe we've done in Asia with Japan and South Korea and, and uh, Australia and New Zealand and all these other allies. They want to do that to us in our own hemisphere. And unfortunately, they show up with a lot of money that they can use to either bribe officials and or, you know, lease out contracts and get contracts that may not have any global competitors for it. And they'll build a port. They'll build bridges. They'll build a soccer stadium. Free money they throw around, a little bribe on the side for the leaders of these countries. It's a, it's, it's a strategy they're pursuing, and, and, and they are doing it with some success. Speaking of that, there, there is talk of, of a new port in La Union, I think, El Salvador. You recently met with the president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele. Talk to us about that meeting, as some have questioned if he's violating human rights with his mass arrest and building of a mega prison. The effort is to be tough on crime, right, but some are wondering if he's trampling on human rights. Why did you want to meet yeah. with him? Well, I think it's a critical and important country. The first off, El Salvador was an unlivable place. I mean, for 30 years, you couldn't go out the street at night. MS-13 and MS-18 gangs actually ran the country for the most part. And every small business in the country either had to pay protection money, had to pay these gangs, or they would kill you or a family member, also leading to mass migration. For the first time in 30 years, people are telling me that's why his approval ratings are so high. I mean, in the 90s, and these are legitimate polling, not even our embassy disputes these things. The reason why he's so popular is he did, he rounded up a bunch of gang members and they've dispersed and he's really put a, a brutal blow on them. I don't think they set out to violate human rights. They had 80 something people killed in one night and police officers targeted and he went hard at him. It's a promise he made. And by the way, voters have rewarded him with a supermajority in their Congress. As far as the port is concerned, we discussed that and other things. And look, I yeah, think I'm curious, what did you, uh, yeah, not to cut you off, Senator, but what did yeah. you tell him about that and, and, and the relationship he's building with the Chinese? Well, I just want them to be clear-eyed. Look, if the Chinese show up and say, here's $100 million of free money, no strings attached, you better look very carefully to make sure there are no strings attached. And, and, and I think it's important for them to clear, be clear-eyed about it. They don't build ports for the fun of it. They build it because they want to dominate that area, because they want to dominate not, they won't just build the port. They will then ensure that their companies control all the logistical sites around it. And, and oftentimes, they'll make these deals that make no financial sense. In essence, they'll never make the money back that they're investing, but they're doing it for geopolitical purposes. So, you know, my sense is that he, like other leaders around the world in developing countries, are trying to figure out how can I leverage this U.S.-China competition to get the best deal I can from both sides. That's what he's trying to do. That's what others are trying to do. We need to be cognizant. That's, that's one of the things that's changing in the world right now. And, and that we have to have leaders that understand that. The world is very different than it was 10 years ago. We have a competitor. We need to act like it. Senator Rubio, we thank you for your time, and we thank you for joining Top Story tonight. We do want to move on tonight. New details about what may have led to Fox News' bombshell dismissal of Tucker Carlson, the top-rated host at Fox and in all of cable news. NBC's Stephanie Gosk has the latest.
The show Tucker Carlson Tonight is officially over and rebranded. But right now, it's time for Fox News Tonight, so let's get started. A source close to the matter tells NBC News that Lachlan Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch's son, and the head of Fox News, Suzanne Scott, decided to get rid of Carlson last Friday. Today, a spokesperson for Fox would not elaborate on the decision. But Carlson was at the center of potentially damaging developments for the network in recent months. In March, a former Fox producer who worked on Carlson's show filed a lawsuit accusing the anchor and the network of a hostile work environment. There's a difference between having a thick skin and being subjected to prejudice and being subjected to misogyny day in and day out, and it wears on you. Carlson has not responded personally to the claims. Fox News says the suit is riddled with false allegations. Fox News has just paid out $787 million to settle the Dominion lawsuit. Citing multiple sources familiar with the situation, L.A. Times reporter Steve Battaglio says the Grossberg litigation played a role in Carlson's departure. That means more court testimony, more depositions, more bad publicity, and possibly another big check. I think they want to avoid that, and one way to do it was to start with getting rid of Tucker. NBC News has not confirmed the reporting. Beyond Grossberg's suit, text messages revealed through the now-settled litigation with Dominion Voting Systems exposed Carlson's frustration with management. In the days following the election, audience numbers dropped more than a third, in part because Fox called the state of Arizona for Joe Biden. According to court documents, Carlson texted, We worked really hard to build what we have. Those expletives are destroying our credibility. It enrages me. Now, less than three years later, Carlson is out of a job. They have lost big names before, they've replaced them, and they haven't missed a beat in the ratings. Changing an anchor does not necessarily mean changing the network. Former President Donald Trump has responded to Tucker Carlson's ouster. He says the fact that Tucker Carlson will no longer be on Fox News is, in his words, a big blow to cable news. He goes on to call Carlson ratings gold. Tom, back to you. All right, Stephanie Goss, for a stain on this story, we heard from Fox producer Abby Grossberg in that piece discussing her lawsuit against Fox and Carlson. Grossberg telling NBC's Nicole Wallace today about the bullying and abuse she says she faced while working for Carlson. Let's take a look. Tucker and his executive producer, Justin Wells, who was also fired, really were responsible for breaking me and making my life a living hell. For more on this, I want to bring in Cynthia McFadden. Cynthia was the first person to do a TV interview with Grossberg a few weeks ago and has been on top of this for NBC News throughout it all. Cynthia, thanks so much for joining us now. And I know you have some, some breaking news as we come on. Can you, can you walk us through what you have right now, what you've learned? Yes. Well, so her lawyer, that is Abby Grossberg's lawyer, uh, has been contacted by the special prosecutor's office for investigating the January 6th events. Uh, and they are working on targeted subpoenas for the documents and the audio tapes that uh, Abby Grossberg uh, recorded while she was at Fox. You know, you, you had a chance to talk to her about the Tucker Carlson firing and, and what you've learned about her negotiations with Fox. What, what, what more have you uncovered? Well, she says she feels vindicated, of course, by the firing, but she says it's not enough. Executives knew about this and per, per, uh, you permitted it. She says that she will not engage in a settlement with Fox without a public apology. And we know that uh, Dominion wanted a public apology. They got a lot of money, but they did not get that apology. There's also some new uh, reporting from Vanity Fair tonight, right? Uh, yeah. uh, some, some, some interesting reporting from Vanity Fair claiming it was something that Tucker Carlson also said recently. Yeah, it's fascinating because, you know, all the little pieces seem to add up to a big hole. I, I, I'm not sure there's any one thing that drove this mm -hmm. firing. I don't think any of us know the answer. But just uh, within the last hour or so, Vanity Fair has published a new report. We have not been able to match this at NBC right. News. Uh, but saying that, that Carlton gave a speech on Friday night, and here's some of what he said, right. that people advocating for transgender rights and the DEI programs want to, in his words, destroy America. He went on to say that we should stop engaging in these totally fraudulent debates, he said. The answer, according to Carlson, was prayer. I have concluded it might be worth taking 10 minutes out of your busy schedule to say a prayer for the future. Now, the article goes on to say that a source has told the writer, Gabe Sherman, who yeah. has written a book about the Murdochs, uh, that that kind of stuff, i.e. religious references, prayer, yeah. freaks Rupert Murdoch out, and he believes, his sources tell him, that that is the reason, the motivation. 
it's fascinating. Yeah, it seems like there's a collection of, of little nuggets that we're learning little by little. Every single day, more stuff's coming out that might have added all up to this. I think you're right. I think we know a few of the notes. I don't think we know the melody yet. Okay. Cynthia McFadden, thanks for that new reporting. We really do appreciate it. All right, we turn now to the start of the latest legal battle for former President Trump. Today, a jury heard opening statements in a civil trial over rape allegations against Donald Trump in a New York courtroom. E. Jean Carroll, a former advice columnist you see there entering the court today, alleges Trump raped her in a New York City department store in the 1990s. Former President Trump has repeatedly said these allegations are not true. I want to bring in senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett. She joins us now here. Laura, so what did, you, what, what did we see play out in court today at least? Well, really, the jury of nine have now heard a vivid description of the facts laid out in opening statements. As you mentioned, the lawyer for E. Jean Carroll uh, describing in, in quite some detail uh, what happened in the 1990s in that dressing room, as she describes it in Burdoff Goodman. Um, and then also the jury heard from Joe Tacopina, this pit bull of a, a defense attorney for the former president who, in, in an interesting strategy there, Tom said, you may hate my client, you may dislike him vehemently, but the way to address that is at the ballot bot, not, not in this court of law, um, calling her lies, calling her story a lie, um, and essentially a, attacking her um, at, at length there. An interesting strategy from Joe Tacopina, Tom. Carol, how, how tough would this case be for Carol? I mean, it's, this, this thing happened 30 years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. She's taking advantage of this new law, which has allowed her this window uh, to sue, something she did just minutes after they passed this law, essentially giving adult victims a chance to bring their story forward. Um, it, the law just passed last fall, actually. And so, remember, this is not a criminal trial, and because it's a civil case, she doesn't have to prove her case beyond a reasonable doubt. All they have to find is that it's more likely than not that she's telling the truth, and if she's telling the truth, that he then defamed her. Her by calling it a hoax, calling her story a lie would satisfy the standard for defamation, Tom. And then, Laura, what do we know? I know there was some mixed reporting about whether the former president would show up to this trial. And yeah. he wasn't there today. Do we think he's going to show up ever? Is he going to take the stand? Takapina all but told that jury that they're not going to hear from him. They are going to hear deposition testimony from the former president. We remember just earlier this month, he appeared in that um, in that courtroom just a stone's throw away in for his criminal trial in Manhattan. But it doesn't appear that he's actually going to show up in this civil case. And I expect that's something that you're going to hear her lawyers hammer, that he's been able to attend a boxing match, he's been able to attend campaign events, but he hasn't bothered to show up in this courtroom for a civil case. I expect that's going to be something that you're going to hear from her attorneys, Tom. Laura Jarrett for us tonight. Laura, we appreciate it. We sure. want to turn now to the weather and the slow motion disaster unfolding along the Mississippi River. Rising waters from above average snow melt already sinking some communities, while others nervously watch and wait for more flooding. Maggie Vespa has the latest. Up and down the mighty Mississippi, historic forecasts of widespread flooding are creeping into fruition. McGregor, Iowa, poised to see its highest river level since 1965. In St. Paul, Minnesota, rushing waters overtake a nearby 70-year-old yacht club filling its pool. Near Davenport, the water's already rising. Typically, we see it slowly start to rise, and so you're moving things here and there. This was, we were at 8, I feel like we were at 11, and 11, 12 is when it starts to come into our home. It just moved a lot quicker this time around. The Dennis family now forced to boat to and from home. You'll notice here in eastern Iowa, the river is flooding and streets are submerged amid a mostly dry forecast. Scientists say this looming flood event isn't so much about falling rain as it is about melting snow. Six to 18 inches of snowpack, scientists say, are rapidly melting in North Dakota and northern Minnesota, feeding the Mississippi's headwaters. The National Weather Service predicts river levels in Minnesota will crest by mid to late week. Parts of Iowa and Illinois could rise until early next week. Stay away from that water. Don't drive around the barricades. Davenport's mayor placing his faith in a wall of sand-filled cubes used only for severe floods, which amid the climate crisis seem more common. All across the country, all across the world, these things seem to be happening. Tonight, much of the Midwest already declaring a disaster, leaving millions on edge. Governors in multiple states, including Iowa and Minnesota, are pleading with people to avoid flooded roads, to fill and use sandbags when they can, which you can see is already happening, and they say pack an emergency kit. Be ready to leave at any point with clothes, medication, all the necessities. Enough, they say, 
for multiple days. Tom? Multiple days. All right, Maggie Vesper for us. Still ahead tonight, survivors subpoenaed. One of the surviving roommates from the University of Idaho murders now called to testify by the defense, which means she could face the alleged killer in court, how she's now trying to fight that. Plus the deadly explosion at a petroleum plant outside of Chicago. What caused it, and is there any risk to the public tonight? And moose on the loose. This is crazy video. The moose getting into a movie theater. Look how big that thing is. And grabbing a snack. How staff ended this wild situation. Stay with us. Top story is just getting started. Now to the latest development in the Idaho murder trial. The defense team for accused killer Brian Koberger is requesting a surviving roommate testify at a preliminary hearing saying she may have information that could clear his name. NBC's Nyla Charles has more on how the roommate is fighting back. Tonight, a bumpy start to a lengthy court battle from the defense team of alleged Idaho murderer suspect Brian Koberger. His team attempting to force a surviving housemate of the Forest Lane University of Idaho students to testify in his defense at a preliminary hearing in June. That roommate, Bethany Funk, is fighting against it, filing her own motion to quash the subpoena in Washoe County, Nevada. There's a good chance this judge will quash the subpoena uh, because the net effect to the witness may be to terrify her, even if that's not the intent. It's unclear when the Washoe County judge will make a decision. According to an affidavit, Funk was in a first-floor bedroom of the apartment house during the early morning of the murders on November 13th. A criminal investigator for Koberger's defense writes that Funk has information that is, quote, exculpatory to the defendant and adds it's, quote, unique to her experiences and cannot be provided by another witness. NBC News reached out to Koberger's attorney but has not received a response. He has yet to enter a plea for his June 26th hearing. Funk was ruled out as a suspect early on, police say, and her lawyers say the defense's claims are without support. They also argue the court does not have the authority to summon a Nevada witness to Idaho for a preliminary hearing. She would potentially have to stay for the duration of Koberger's trial. One reason the defense may want to call this witness is they have some reason to believe that she'll testify inconsistently with what she's told police in the past. If that were to happen while she's under oath, that would be a really big benefit to the defense because now they'll have something to cross-examine her with at trial. Funk and the other surviving roommate, Dylan Mortensen, have not spoken publicly about the case, but honored their fallen friends in letters read by a pastor at a church vigil. They all lit up any room they walked into and were gifts to this world. I wish every day that I could give them all one last hug and say how much I loved them. Investigators have not said whether Koberger knew the victims or why he would have targeted them, and a motive is yet to be revealed but traced DNA that was on a knife sheath left at the crime scene to him. The murder weapon, police say, believed to be a knife, has yet to be found. Nyla Charles joins us now from L.A. Nyla, do we know any more details on why the defense has called Bethany Funk to testify and not the other roommate? Tom, because the judge issued a gag order in January barring anyone involved with the case from making statements, we don't know what Funk saw or didn't see, but clearly the defense finds it beneficial to their case. Here's what we know about the other roommate, Dylan Mortensen. A police report says the morning of the murders, she woke up to voices and saw a suspect walking past her with a mask on. The defense, as of now, not calling on her, but we'll see how this plays out in court. Tom? Yeah, her testimony will definitely be critical in that trial. Okay, Nyla, thank you so much. When we come back, the Bud Light shakeup. You've probably heard about the backlash against the beer giant after the company sent a transgender influencer a beer can with her face on it. Now two top executives are on leave because of that. We'll explain next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the manhunt for Jack Astar. Bam Majera. Pennsylvania State Police saying they've issued an arrest warrant for the former TV personality after he fled from police following a physical confrontation at his family's home outside of Philadelphia. He's accused of assault, harassment, and making terroristic threats. Authorities are asking anyone with information on his whereabouts to call them. An investigation is underway into a deadly petroleum plant explosion just outside of Chicago. Video shows flames and thick black smoke coming out of Seneca Petroleum after an asphalt tank blew up. At least one person is dead and another hurt. Emergency officials do not believe there's any threat to the public, but the blast did knock down several power lines and has shut down roads in the area. Toy maker Mattel is introducing its first ever Barbie representing someone with Down syndrome. Mattel says it worked closely with the National Down Syndrome Society to create the doll shape 
features and accessories, incorporating a shorter frame and a longer torso than other Barbies. The doll's dress is covered with yellow and blue butterflies and flowers, the colors associated with Down syndrome awareness. She also wears a pink necklace made to represent three copies of the 21st, the 20, uh, 21st chromosome. And workers at a movie theater near Anchorage, Alaska had an unexpected visitor. Take a look at this. Surveillance video capturing the moment a young moose wandered into the lobby and he didn't seem to be interested in a late night screening. He stuck around for several minutes sniffing the concession stand before making his way over to some leftover popcorn by the trash. Employees were eventually able to guide the moose towards the exit. Okay, we turn now to the growing controversy surrounding Bud Light, the beer company facing backlash from conservatives for partnering with a transgender TikTok influencer. Two marketing executives at Bud Light's parent company now reportedly on leave as the company comes under fire from high-profile Republicans. Sam Brock is there. Tonight, Bud Light's controversy is still brewing. The latest fallout, two top marketing executives on Leaf, a company spokeswoman telling the Wall Street Journal. So what spurred all the backlash about beer? Impressive carrying skills, right? I got some Bud Lights for us. It follows a polarizing and brief brand partnership with trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney during March Madness, who told her 1.8 million followers on Instagram that Bud Light sent her a can with her face on it, celebrating her first year as a woman. Whatever team you love, I love too. But for some fans of the brand, it was no cause to celebrate. F Bud Light and f Anheuser Busch. The hashtag Bud Light boycott appearing online and viral TikTok showing users pouring out the beer, destroying cans, and even going as far as pretending drinking the beverage leads them to change gender. Offline, a Florida restaurant refusing to sell Bud Light, telling our affiliate they removed the drink from its menu because transgenderism is in direct opposition to their biblical faith. But as the culture war swirled around Bud Light, memes turned into misinformation. Videos like this surfacing, purporting to show mountains of their beer being steamrolled. When really, it was a video of beer that was seized at the border being destroyed after the pandemic. And another clip circulating showing a, quote, crybabies billboard that Bud Light did not actually put up. One marketing expert says sometimes instigation is by design. I do not believe that someone did not sit and think our primary audience is going to turn. To what degree is up in the air, but we're definitely going to get that pushback. And it feels like someone saw a value in that. But the company trying to do some damage control, issuing a statement on April 14th saying in part, we never intended to be part of a discussion that divides people. We're in the business of bringing people together over a beer. Still, the announcement not doing much to stem outrage. That week, Bud Light sales dropping 17% compared to the year before, according to data compiled from industry group Bump Williams Consulting, who called it a, quote, notable acceleration of the sales declines. This as competitors, Coors Light and Miller Light, simultaneously saw bumps as Bud Light is under the microscope. Both those other brands continue to support Pride initiatives. Miller Lite believes that everyone deserves to be their authentic selves. And it didn't take long for politicians to jump into the fray. You know, I'd rather be governed by we the people than, than woke companies. And so I think pushback is in order across the board, including with Bud Light. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis claiming corporate America is trying to change the country. And Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders now selling koozies that look like Bud Light cans but say real woman on them. Some big companies can't tell the difference between real and fake anymore. Companies and elected leaders trying to leverage the situation. The algorithms on social media platforms, they favor outrage. They favor all caps. And brands and politicians are figuring it out. Supporters of the Bud Light campaign aren't staying silent. And the White House press secretary even weighing in. When a transgender American uh, posts a, a, a video about a brand of beer they enjoy uh, and, it, and it leads to bomb threats, uh, it's clear that that level of violence and vitriol against uh, transgender Americans has to stop. Mulvaney speaking out on the podcast Onward with Rosie O'Donnell. And the reason that I think I am so, um, I'm an easy target is because I'm so new to this. We reached out to the influencer for comment and haven't heard back yet, nor were we able to contact the two executives on leave. The company telling the New York Times amid the controversy, it made, quote, adjustments to streamline the structure of our marketing. As one of America's signature brands is caught in the middle of a cultural tug of war over the country's identity.
All right, Sam Brock joins us tonight from Miami. Sam, it's interesting. This is not the first time Anheuser-Busch, right, has gotten into some trouble over messaging when it comes to LGBTQ issues. Anheuser-Busch, Tom, has straddled both sides of this issue. Seemingly, on one hand, they've been lauded by human rights groups for being an exemplary company supporting the LGBTQ community with ads, Tom, dating back really to the 90s in magazines and television, certainly. On the other side of the equation, they've been criticized as recently as 2021 for donating tens of thousands of dollars to lawmakers on the state level who are pushing anti-LGBTQ agendas. So it's a complicated history. But here's the upshot here. Look at their stock price right now. It's at about $65 a share, which is near its 52-week high, despite this controversy. Tom? All right, Sam Brock, for us, Sam, we appreciate it. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, the dramatic rescue of migrants off the coast of Italy. New footage released by the Italian Coast Guard shows the moment a group of migrants desperately swam towards officers after their boat sank. More than 800 migrants were rescued by authorities. This comes as Italy faces a surge of migrants coming from North Africa with more than 28,000 arrivals so far this year. Now to Cuba, where the country is experiencing a gas shortage on top of a growing economic crisis. Authorities are now suspending activities and even moving some university classes online. The annual May Day celebration will also be modified due to the situation. Experts say Cuba, which produces half of the crude oil it needs, is having difficulties refining it, and that's causing the shortage. And Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido was expelled from Colombia. Guaido says he was kicked out of the country just hours after he arrived in Bogota for a conference. In a video on Twitter, he says he entered Colombia trying to escape persecution by the Venezuelan government. Colombian officials say he was irregularly in the country and was escorted to a U.S.-bound flight, which brought him to Miami. Thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.